All right. I know that I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so I will try not to keep you too long. Um, thank you for staying. Um, I am Angela Stickle, and I am at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about some of the new observations that we're making of lunar surface using the Minear F radar aboard LRO. So um, let's see. So just to start with, um, we know that lunar regolith, when you look at it in um, sort of uh, optical wavelengths, um, behaves in sort of a predictable way. As you go across the phase angle that you're observing it, um, you see this sort of characteristic response, where at low phase angles you get this upturn, which is the opposition effect, um, and you see sort of higher values um, of, the, of the, uh, the light scattered back towards you. So we know that this happens in optical wavelengths for samples here in the lab. Um, our question was, can we observe this on the moon and can we observe it using other wavelengths? So um, we decided to try to observe this effect and see if it was actually something that we see at larger scales um, using MINIRF, which is, I'll describe a bit more for those of you who aren't familiar with. Um, and sort of the easiest way to do that was to look at young craters on the moon. So young craters on the moon, um, in radar data really light up. So this here is, uh, I think this is Kepler. Um, you can see here, this is the circular polarization ratio and you see the ejecta light up um, with high returns coming back. And so that's indicative of a rough surface um, on the order of the wavelength of the radar and sort of blocky material um, at, um, at, at or near the surface. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to be able to look at this um, and see if we can observe any of this sort of effect um, at various craters on the lunar surface. So, let's see. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with MINIRF, or we don't spend a lot of time thinking about lunar radar, uh, MINIRF is aboard LRO. You can see here is an image, artist image. Uh, it's sitting on the side of the, of the spacecraft there. Um, initially, it was designed to both transmit and receive uh, radar signals at the lunar surface in both S-band and X-band. So at uh, 12 centimeters wavelength and about four centimeters wavelength. Um, what happens is that MINIREF transmits a circular polarized wave down to the surface. It hits the surface, scatters around, and it comes back into orthogonal uh, polarizations, horizontal and vertical. And what this does is it allows us to create a variety of daughter products and analyze the surface using traditional um, radar techniques. And one of those daughter products um, we can, uh, we can derive is the, the circular polarization ratio, which I mentioned before, um, which is basically a map of the roughness on the, on the wavelength. So this is CPR of the moon, um, uh, near side and far side, at S-band, so 12 centimeters. So what this is showing us is things on the order of tens of centimeters to a meter size um, on the surface or within about the first meter of the surface. And you can see here these bright red spots um, and some of these bigger basins, those are the young, fresh craters, and this ejecta is very rough near the surface. So what we want to do is then look at these. Um, so as I said, MINIREF originally was both a transmitter and a receiver, and we mapped the surface here. So this is, you know, what we managed to map before. Unfortunately, the transmitter on MINIREF failed um, on Christmas Eve, which was, I'm sure, very nice for the team. Uh, so uh, some very smart people put their heads together and came up with a new sort of CONOPS situation where instead of being a monostatic radar, MINIREF would become a bistatic um, experiment. And um, what we have done with this is basically we transmit from the Earth to the Moon using um, either Arecibo in Puerto Rico or one of the uh, DSN telescopes in California. They light up the Moon for us at both S and X band and then MINIREF receives a signal back from the surface. Um, so what this allows us to do is based on where, you know, where the moon is in the sky and where LRO is with respect to the moon, we get sort of this angle between um, the viewing geometry, and that's called the bistatic angle. And that allows us to then go back and look at how things vary, um, similarly to what you can do in the lab for, um, for optical wavelengths. So right now we are operating um, in this mode. We are taking data um, a few times a month and using, well, we were using Arecibo. Um, the hurricane may have changed that. Um, 
using Arecibo for S-band observations and the DSN for X-band observations. Um, and so we've been doing this for several years now, and the sort of main purpose of this campaign is to either look at these sort of rocky surfaces and try to understand this effect as a function of phase angle or by static angle, I'll probably say both of those things, um, or to look for water ice. So those were our two main goals. Um, you can see here, there's a, a couple of um, uh, um, experiments. So this is the same one I showed earlier. So this is the lunar regolith, and you can see you get this opposition effect. I think I have a little box. You get this opposition effect that happens, you know, the turn up happens at about somewhere between three, five, somewhere in that range degrees of phase angle. Um, water ice, on the other hand, here's a, some experiments done with a, a water ice analog, and you see that this sort of upturn happens at much lower degrees. So by doing this and mapping the moon, we can try to find um, water ice at the poles or better understand the way that these rocks scatter um, at the rest of the moon. So, um, I'm not going to be talking about the water ice search. Uh, Wes Patterson has recently published a paper about our search for water ice at Cabeus Crater doing this method, so if you want to see that, I, um, it's in the Icarus LRO special issue. Um, so I'm going to focus instead on trying to compare these observations or this type of observation um, with radar and see if radar shows us the same sorts of behaviors. All right, so just quickly, so what are we observing with the radar? Um, I think, so most people, look at the moon probably in optical or um, near visible, near IR wavelengths. So they're down here. They're looking at sort of the really fine stuff, the very top layer of things, um, and seeing you know, what the minerals are. When you go up into radar, however, you're looking at much larger things. So for S-band, which is predominantly what I'm going to be showing you today, the wavelength is 12.6 centimeters. So we're looking at things like on the order of you know, coins to sort of people-sized, this the lunar uh, lander, that's that sort of size boulder. So that's what we're saying when we're looking at S-band. Um, in the X-band, we're looking at sort of smaller things. You kind of have a little bit of overlap. Maybe you're on the order of P's, some fines, not quite fines, but sort of larger hand size specimens. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we are going to be looking at and how, how they scatter the, the radiation. Okay, so, um, so far we have um, collected data for, I think, 10 um, Copernican-ish craters. Um, they've either been labeled as Copernican on maps or they show up brightly in the data. Uh, Hercules is our exception. Here it's Eratosthenian. It's going to give us a little bit of a benchmark to look at age effects for some of these things. Um, and this is just to show you that, you know, we have multiple collects for a lot of these things. Most of them are in S-band. Um, we're working to fill out the X-band um, data and to fill out gaps that we have in, in these observations. Okay, so what did we do? We basically have taken collects, so this is a collect as, as the radar travels across the lunar surface. What happens is that geometry changes and sweeps out a range of phase angles um, that get returned back to the radar. So this is Kepler again, and you can see here's the CPR, and then here is the same area, and this is the range of phase angles that we're observing. Um, and so we've taken um, all of the pixels that are within the ejecta blanket here, um, and their corresponding phase angle, and that's shown there. And then what happens is we bin them into roughly a tenth of a degree bins um, and plot the average value. So you can see here, this is then the average CPR, which you can't really see. CPR is a function of phase angle for Kepler crater for this collect. And we've done that for all of the different collects that we have. When we have multiple collects of a crater, we average them together um, to get a curve that covers a wider phase space. And this is basically what it looks like. So this is where we were um, several months ago with a number of collects that we had. So you can see sort of a wide variety of behaviors. So um, we have some data gaps here where we're trying to fill them in. We don't have quite the same coverage for all of our craters, but you see lots of different things going on. So um, for some craters, we see what looks to be like a very clear opposition effect. So Aristarchus here turns up very nicely at low phase angles, Burgess A, um, which we know is a very young crater, has some um, indications of having a similar upturn. Um, Kepler is a little strange, right? We have kind of flat stuff at large phase angles and then 
another flat region, but at higher values, at lower phase angles. So it's maybe an opposition effect, but maybe something a little bit different. Um, there's some indications that Lacondamine S is similar. So we're seeing lots of different behaviors as we examine the ejecta of all these different craters. Um, Anaxagoras, we don't have the low phase angles just yet, but um, is looking pretty flat, right? Um, so um, that was where we were, you know, six, eight months ago. And since then, we've collected a few more. Um, so these are the newest data from NRF. The next few things I'm going to show you um, have been collected in the last couple of months. Um, so this is an S-band collect of Schoenberger A. So here you can see is the Schoenberger crater, and this A is right next to it. Um, this is the uh, CPR image. You can see here um, it's a little noisy, but you can see the, the ejecta has got a higher CPR, and then the phase angle range that we're sweeping out. We've got sort of a mid-range of angles here. And we're going to take you know, the pixels here and over here um, to, to look at. And what that looks like is this. So we've got angles from about two to six. And you can see, again, maybe something a little weird is going on. Um, we do have sort of this up you know, in value um, at five-ish degrees, but then it flattens out, which is not what we see in the lunar samples for, for lower wavelengths. So we're not, you know, it's a little bit different of, of behavior here. Oh, so yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, Hercules, as I said, is our oldest crater that we're looking at. We're going to use it as sort of a baseline to try to test whether or not this can be used as another way to sort of relatively age date craters. Um, and you can see there's not much going on. It's very flat. Um, basically, we, we have basically down to zero degrees at the crater ejecta and then outward. We don't see anything at all, really. Um, this probably isn't unexpected. Um, older craters are going to break down. The ejecta will have broken down a lot more. And so you're not expecting to see as much of a rough surface. So you maybe don't expect to see this upturn at low phase angles. Um, and so that's, that's nice. It can be used as sort of a baseline behavior for um, old craters versus young craters. Um, and so now, okay, so this is the summary of all the S-band craters. Uh, we have nine that we've done in S-band, and you can see, again, sort of a variety of behaviors. Um, some of it is expected, some of it less so. Um, but things like Bouguet or Harpalis, which are, you know, Copernican-aged craters and have these bright, beautiful ejecta blankets, maybe are older, right, than some of these other things, just based upon this, if we can compare it to Hercules as sort of a baseline. Um, and so this, this is definitely still something we're working on analyzing, but this is sort of, um, we're hoping that this can help us sort of relatively age date these Copernican craters and put a bit more of a fine, um, fine uh, uh, order to them. Uh, okay, so th we've already seen this. This is Anaxagoras and S-band, and I just want to show it to you again because our newest collects are Anaxagoras and X-band, um, which we're very excited about. They're the first X-band biostatic collects done at the moon. And so this is what it looks like. It's pretty flat, but we only have down to about four degrees. Um, if you go to X-band, so this is, again, 4.2 centimeters. Um, so here's the crater. Um, and this is a collect that we did, uh, I don't know, on day 96 of this year, February maybe, March. Um, and you can see here, you see the bright ejecta. Um, and then we're kind of at these low phase angles. Um, this is the second collect that we did about 30 days later, and you can see again, you get the nice ejecta blanket here, um, uh, at, and then we're at, again, sort of these really low phase angles. So this is then, if we uh, look at what the, f the behavior looks like, you can see here we've got the sort of flat behavior out at six, five and six degrees, but we start, start, are starting to see this nice opposition effect upturn at low degrees in X-band um, X -band data. And this is to compare it to S-band. So you can see um, this is about the phase angle range that we have in X. Um, and then, you know, maybe we might then expect to see this upturn in S because we don't have an observation yet. We're working to fill that out. Um, but we can see sort of different behavior at these different wavelengths, which is interesting because if you remember, we're sensing different things. So in X-band, we're looking at smaller rocks, where in S-band, we're looking at bigger things. So if they've broken down in S-band, we might still expect to see them in X-band, um, and that could tell us something about the age of the crater, um, too, when we start comparing against other things. Uh, like I said, we're working hard to fill out the X-band data. Um, we don't have very many collects yet, but that's um, what we're working with now. Um, 
I think I've already said this, so I'm going to go to the summary because I have used all of my time. Um, so basically, uh, we're seeing a variety of possible opposition effect type things in radar data. This is the first time this has been done at the moon. Um, so we're working to understand, um, is it the same sort of thing that we're seeing in optical wavelengths, or is it different, and how can it um, help us put some constraints on the ages of these craters? Um, and having multiple wavelengths for different craters, we think, will help a lot with that. And so that's um, what MINIREF is up to right now, at least what I'm doing with MINIREF. So thank you.